I always said, except for this walking thing, I'm in great health. I saw a video. I opened it and watched a man in a wheelchair have his brain hooked up and he controlled an electronic arm and he was learning to move it. And at the end of the study, they said they were looking for volunteers. And as soon as it was over, we called. I didn't know where it's going to end up. And I'm going to feed myself chocolate before this is over. I've killed over 250 people in the last couple of years, and I'm still at large. <laughs> uh, I write and produce murder mystery parties. I started doing this in Pittsburgh. and I, I was a very healthy person. And one day, I was walking a lot that evening. It felt my, like my legs were dragging behind me. Same thing happened a week later. Then that started happening more and more frequently. I had no idea what was going to happen, what the prognosis was. So we made plans to move back to Pittsburgh. Uh, when I got to Pittsburgh, I saw a doctor at UPMC. He did his tests and three or four months later pronounced that I had spinal cerebellar degeneration. That. I can move my neck and my head, and that's about it. With Jan, we're hoping to achieve the ability to control an arm and a hand in space. The ideal scenario would be that she could move to a place in space, orient a wrist, and then have a variety of different grasps with her hand so that she could pick up different objects like a Coke bottle or a set of keys or a fork. I can't wait to do this, to be part of the medical science to push the technology onward. And for the fun for me, because I haven't been able to move my arm for 10 years. So just being able to physically move something else. I can't wait, this would be so cool. These are electrodes that have 96 contacts and then they're literally injected into the surface of the brain. And that just allows the electrodes to penetrate the surface so that you can record the responses of individual neurons as well as populations of neurons. And so in this case we implanted two. Um, these are implanted along the motor strip and really tried to target this so that we would place one centered in the areas that were activated when she was imagining using her hand, and then uh, place the second one in the area that was activated when she imagined using her shoulder. Two days after surgery, we went over to the rehab hospital and we took the system with us so we could plug her in, and we were just curious to find out whether or not we could record uh, anything that sounded like a neuron. Right. Okay. When we hooked her up for the first time and we had her think about moving her little finger, right then we knew we'd, we'd done everything really well and that we had a really good circumstance so that, you know, we could do good recordings and that Jan was going to work out really well. Okay, now go ahead and try moving your wrist. There you go. There we go. Every day as we get closer, as we drive closer and then we come up the road, to come to the lab, I'm thinking, oh good, what are we gonna do today? What's gonna be new? And every time we do something new, it's challenging at first, and then when I get 28 out of 30 or whatever the score is, and they say that was all you, that wasn't the computer doing it, that was all you, I just can't stop smiling, it's so cool. I'm moving things, I have not moved things for about 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. Very fast. Okay. Now you to go. Initially, we started out with her doing three-dimensional control of the hand, and so she's controlling the endpoint position of the arm, moving forward, backward, up, down, left, and right, that kind of thing. And so, since she was making good progress with that, we decided to try to add in orientation of the wrist, so rotating, you know, in all three directions, um, and then also adding in grasp. So that's where we're sort of focusing now on seven-dimensional control of this endpoint position, um, orientation, and grasp, and sort of really working on interacting with objects and being able to move them around her environment. This counterclockwise. I used to have to think up, uh, clockwise, down, forward, back. Now I just look at the target 
and Hector goes there. It's not a matter of thinking which direction anymore. It's just I want to do that and my brain knows what things to move to make that happen. Right now, all Jan is doing is imagining moving the arm exactly where she wants the arm to go, just like you or I would control our own arm. Uh, the, what, what we've done interestingly with Jan is that normally the computer controls a little bit and Jan controls a little bit, at least that's how we started. Uh, Jan didn't want to know when we switched the computer control off. She didn't want to know when we weren't assisting her in the task. And, and almost as soon as she said that, we flipped all the controls off, so we gave her complete control of the arm and then she controlled it perfectly. Oh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> that was incredible. 20 out of 20. You made that look like training. Now I'm performing the computer, because <laughs> it doesn't usually do more than I do. There are things I regret not doing when I was able. You know, not skydiving, but some adventures I would love to have had, and I regret not doing them now. Then this, this is the ride of my life. I keep saying this is... This is the roller coaster. This is the skydiving. It's just fabulous, and I'm enjoying every second of it. From the beginning, we've been really focused on, you know, how much control can you get of this arm, moving the hand and wrist and everything. But, you know, Jan's goal has really been to feed herself a piece of chocolate. I think the highlights of the study are watching Jan feed herself, um, watching Jan move objects, watching her complete tests that we normally have for people with stroke who are trying to recover function and having this beautiful fluid control of a robotic arm through thought. <laughs> I think it would be great to really get her to the point where she can actually feed enough food that she can satisfy herself and that it becomes routine. I guess I'm a little worried that she's eating uh, just chocolate and cheese. We need to start to vary the diet a little bit. Today I accomplished a goal that I set before the surgery even took place. Um, they were asking if there was something special I wanted to do, like touch my children's cheek or hold my husband's hand, and I said, my goal is to feed myself chocolate. And I did that today. I fed myself chocolate, and then a string cheese, and then a red pepper. So we're trying to get oh, a balanced diet here. You watch Jan smile um, after completing a task uh, in a time that's close to what I could complete that task in. And you think, wow, how do we have to, we just have to take the next steps where we can make this a clinical tool, not a research one. It, it overwhelms me. I'm so glad I did this. And I know some people will watch this down the road and say, you know what? I could do that. I can't hold a job anymore. I can't even hug my children or pick up a pen to write. But I can do that and I can make a difference for people in the future. So I'm excited to think that our work here and the lab will inspire more people to come forward and for the work to continue. <laughs> <laughs>